Hello, good night. My name is Lucia San Roman. I am the director of visual arts here at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming tonight. This is a very special um, occasion for us. The third installment of our city, city initiative, now with a Bay Area practitioner, the Open Workshop. Um, it's a very exciting moment for us because I think that you, you might agree, I don't know if you saw the other two exhibitions, Teddy Cruz and Fona Foreman and Hector Design previous to this one, and I think that we're hitting our stride. And I think we're hitting our stride both in terms of installation, but also in terms of figuring out that our bread and butter should be the Bay Area in terms of this presentation of design practices. Maybe once in a while doing someone from elsewhere. But it's so exciting to finally get to understand and know better what is happening here, and particularly to do so through the eyes of Martin, Martin Strickland, who is over there by the wall, who is our lead, um, really a curator in a way, but he's also the producers for the show, and I'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute. First of all, I'll just introduce the open workshop with their description, which has been slightly edited. Then we can go into understanding what it means when we have our discussion together with Niraj. So the open workshop is an architectural or urbanism practice that focuses on the relationship between form and territory. Speci specifically, the firm is interested in the agency of form to impact political, economic, and ecological systems. The office name, the open workshop, is in reference to Umberto Eco's 1962 treaties, The Open Work. The office is dedicated to evolving Eco's concept into architecture by, by expanding the subject to include the pluralistic public realm and transforming environmental context. Now, this is a very condensed explanation, and I'm hoping that when Niraj and I have our conversation, which is really the format for our discussion today, we can go through every single line and unpack it in detail. <laughs> um, Niraj Bhatia is a licensed architect and urban designer from Toronto, Canada, and is the founder of the Open Workshop. His work resides at the intersection of politics, infrastructure, and urbanism. He's an assistant professor at, at CCA, where he also co-directs the Urbanism Research Lab, the Urban Works Agency. So it's I, I want to just say one more thing before we invite I invite uh, Niraj over here, which is to say that as YBCA figures out how to be the creative home for civic action, which is our mandate, it becomes increasingly important to make exhibitions that are both beautiful and moving and exciting and, co and cause us to be curious, but also have a politic to them. And that the two are balanced. So when I hear or read uh, Niraj talking about an interest in the agency of form to impact political, economic, and ecological systems, I see a little bit of that. I see a little bit of the idea that you can actually have a, um, an infrastructure, a built environment, a made world that balances that which moves us, which is ethics and aesthetics together. I think a lot of us, at least I am moved by that with that which seduces us. So, without any more explanation, please join me in welcoming Niraj Bhatia. very simple presentation today. It's really a walk through the exhibition. We are testing also at the YBCA forms of being more, um, uh, more accessible. And that means um, sometimes coming down from the abstraction of a theoretical practice into the actuality of having walls with objects on them <laughs> and having people who create those walls and objects on them. Um, I would uh, um, just... Uh, encourage us to start, just without any more explanation. Maybe we're going to go work by work, essentially. So um, please bear with us as we imaginatively move through these spaces. Slide, please. 
And that's, of course, the background of the, of the piece, which is one of the first things that you created as, as Martin, actually, and I approached you um, in the process of creating this exhibition, which I should say also was an exhibition that, um, of which there are at least two brand new pieces, which we will discuss in a minute. But why, why did you create this piece and how did it function for you? Well, this was our first way to try to draw what we were uh, designing for the exhibition and convince YBCA to go for it. And um, it's, it's essentially, and you, you'll see out there, um, I guess a series of uh, ways of understanding the different ways architects represent uh, their mediums that they work in. Um, and the range of those ways are you know, inserted in each of these modules that are hanging from the ceiling. and. Um, and we wanted to really play with this kind of question between lightness and heaviness. I think sometimes we feel like these systems around us are very um, stable and unmovable, um, but we wanted to also show that there are actually a lot of ways that you can change things around you as an individual. Mm -hmm. And for us as an institution, when we receive a proposal by a, a, a gifted architect, design, or artist, there are two things that come up. First of all is excitement, and the second is fear. And, and probably, hopefully, if you're a good institution, the first one is actually the one that carries the day. The second one, the fear, is the one that you figure out how to negotiate internally or actually how to make it um, possible in the, in the world of the physical infrastructure you have to work with, in the world of economics you have to work with, and in the world of interactivity. Um, we will, of course, touch more on that when we actually see the images of that installation. But in the meantime, maybe next slide, please. Okay, so this one. I think that in your description of the office there are uh, references to the economic systems, politics, etc. We didn't actually mention at all the reason why the exhibition is called um, it's called new. What is it called, Arshel? <laughs> <laughs> new experiments. New experiments in collective form. New investigations in collective form. And so maybe this is a good moment to touch on that. Yeah, sure. Um, so as you guys know very well, that this building is designed by Fumi Komaki. Um, and Fumi Komaki, <laughs> I guess he did this building in the 80s? I don't know the exact time. I think he designed it in the, in the late 80s late or in the, during the 80s, and it was executed in the early 90s and opened in 93. So you know, Young and Maki's career in the 60s, uh, one of his first texts was called Investigations in Collective Form. And this was a really powerful text because it was a moment when he was uh, just graduated and he was trying to find um, ways to create collectivity through design and was mining you know, different approaches that had been done historically. <laughs> and this was a moment that he writes in the text, you know, uh, massive uh, economic changes, a more heterogeneous co concept of the public and their institutions. And there's this question of how to bring people together and, and is there a way that form and architecture can structure this? So he had three approaches um, in his piece. He called uh, them compositional form, which was really a modernist approach of putting uh, different objects on a two-dimensional plane. Uh, so we see that sort of in kind of platform object projects of civic centers that were designed mostly in the 60s. Um, group form, which was a sort of sequential form. Uh, so he uses an example of a Mediterranean hillside town where there's a consistent materiality and each kind of parcel accommodates or thinks about the next parcel. So it looks like a unified thing, even though it's built by a lot of separate people organically through time. Um, and finally, he has uh, the megastructure. And this was actually what made the text iconic. It was the first text to define the megastructure. And this isn't um, what we often think of as the megastructure, just big structures. This was a, a very particular architectural project where a large frame or truss um, kind of held together a project, and there was a lot of interchangeable units uh, within that trust. And it was simultaneously, therefore, very top-down um, and very bottom-up. So it, it, and it positioned architecture as an infrastructure. Um, so the architect designed structural systems, how plumbing worked, and so forth. But the individuals designed how units inserted themselves and could adapt themselves within it. Um, and it's been you know, now, I guess, like 40, 50 years since his text. and. Um, when we got the invitation to do this exhibition, we were just reflecting on uh, the projects we've been doing in the last five years and trying to categorize them. And I think all of them are joined by this idea of trying to search for how to create a collectivity in a pluralistic society. Um, so these, these drawings here, 
uh, essentially frame five approaches that uh, we have throughout the show. Um, and they're, they're set up almost like a taxonomy of these approaches. Um, so we have, and I can't read the font, so I may be yeah. reading them out of, out of order. Um, but we have uh, what we call frameworks, which is, um, or soft frameworks, which is piggybacking off of the idea of the megastructure, but uh, considering how these things could be done more incrementally um, and done with less capital investment and actually have abilities to change the frame itself uh, through design. Um, then the articulated surface, this is, these are projects that use the horizontal plane to organize things. So one of the things we uh, notice in the contemporary city is that it's really expanded horizontally. And so uh, horizontalism uh, produces more flexibility. So we could talk about you know, the parking lot is the most flexible urban space uh, because nothing happens there. And so <laughs> flexibility kind of goes with nothingness often. And it reduces architecture often to uh, like furniture, location design, or paint on the ground, or whatnot. Um, so these projects try to articulate a surface to uh, you know, understand that there is a flexibility in the horizontal plane, but you also need articulation to create a collective and place yourself within a vast horizontal uh, plane. Um, then we have uh, projects that are kind of time-based. So we have a series of projects that were theming uh, rewiring states, and these are projects that look at different states of materiality, uh, different states of time, and really push design through scheduling, um, which is really different than most architecture, because we typically, as architects, try to control states and, mm -hmm. and have one singular state. Uh, so these actually try to reverse that and work with time as a, as a major medium. Um, and then we have a series of projects called the Living Archives. These are these look at time in a very different way and collectivity in a different way and really piggyback off uh, one of Hannah Arendt's concepts in The Human Condition where she talks about the public realm requiring a level of permanence. And um, for us, you know, the way she talks about it is that permanence connects a collective of a particular time to generations that came before them and situates them in terms of generations that will come after them. So it's a very different form of collectivity that we're thinking about there. And so those projects try to um, you know, bring the archive alive um, and make the user uh, the subject of the archive part of understanding that work. Um, and finally, we have uh, the last approach, what we're calling comedy. This is much more of a programmatic. Comedy. Comedy, yeah. So the commons were land that were collectively owned, uh, governed, and managed, um, typically for agriculture or grazing. And these projects uh, attempt to understand how uh, more equitable distribution of land and resources could happen in more urban environments. Mm -hmm. You began the open workshop in 2013, if I remember correctly, just before you actually came to live in San Francisco, where it actually acquired the form that it has today. Were you thinking of these concepts then? Are these concepts that you have developed while well, here or through since then? And how has living in San Francisco uh, changed or not your way of addressing uh, architecture, architecture and urbanism? Um, I, some of these projects were done you know, just before. We, we had a really productive summer just before coming to San Francisco, so there was maybe six projects we did in one summer. Um, and those, you know, do touch on all these themes. So there was some of the foundation that was laid, um, but I don't think we were thinking of them thematically. It was, you know, um, like this exhibition was really helpful for us to step back and look at these themes and, and unpack them. So it's much more um, project specific. And then only when you look back after you produce a body of work, do you realize, oh, there's there's some patterns or similarities or groupings that exist um, amongst the projects. Um, one thing I will say about you know San Francisco is that I, I, San Francisco, you have to be a really good architect to practice in San Francisco. Um, you have to be very patient. Yes. <laughs> you have to know uh, the zoning code really well. Um, there's there's just you know I think a lot of San Francisco architects are overlooked um, in kind of a national and global discourse. Um, but I think there's so much talent here in the Bay Area, and it's it's talent that doesn't express itself through. Um, always, you know, iconic buildings, and I think it's, it's, there's a subtlety in the design here, and it's something that we also have in our work that um, tries to look for more long-term ways of understanding aesthetics and um, not really uh, veering into kind of uh, momentary trends or things like this. So uh, San Francisco has been very helpful for us just to 
understand that, um, that longer trajectory. I, I also think there's such an amazing legacy here of bottom-up uh, DIY activism mm -hmm. and truly politics that have formed, um, you know, through people organizing themselves. Um, and I think it's inspiring to see. There is also um, in your work uh, the role that the, the graphic design plays and spe a, a specific aesthetic that I don't always associate with the normal sort of architect's drawings, mercifully, frankly. Um, they have a lot of personality, but also you use the miniature a lot. For, for these pieces, for example, you, we, have, we are asked us, as viewers to use this magnifying glass. So there is a kind of intimacy already. You become, it's not that you become part of the work. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that there is like this thing of, of, the, of the visit to the archive and this movement of the body. And I notice, of course, as we go through the exhibition, that the miniature and what it asks of you as a viewer continues to run as a thread. Maybe we can go to the next image. Slide, please. There it is again, see, the tiny models. Can you explain this work a little bit for us? Well, um, well, 3D printing is very expensive. <laughs> um, um, the, you know, the idea with the smaller drawings and the magnifying glasses or even some of these smaller models is that it forces, um, forces a very intimate uh, relationship between the viewer and the object, right? And so it's strange, you know, because the exhibition is called Investigations in Collective Form, but there's also a lot of intimacy that is being produced. And, and I think that's the tension in a lot of the work is how to, the other side of collectivity is individualism. And if you have a society that's all about individualism, uh, we know what the ramifications are there, but if you have a society that's completely about collectivity, you don't have distinct voices that are added to the collective realm. Um, and so it's always this balancing act between uh, individual distinct voices and a collective platform that these voices uh, come together in. And so you'll, you'll see this, you know, as we go through the other pieces, that there's often smaller pieces, but those pieces are tied to a bigger thing, and there's an action and a reaction between the individual and the collective in the pieces. So there's a system, systems approach to thinking about this sort of atomic or intimate encounters or intimacy. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And this is actually some, I, I really, uh, we weren't thinking of in, including this piece. And Niraj has this very soft way of being insistent, where he doesn't actually say, I like this. He just sort of says, maybe you, we could think about it. <laughs> or it just simply happens. And Martin also was advocating in his own quiet way, who is really the curator of the show on, in, in the practical sense, um, and in every way, really. He was advocating in a practical, for these for these works to have a more central um, a central uh, position in the whole argument of the exhibition, and I think it was a very good idea because it actually helps us to foreground some of the ideas in a more uh, with data, right? It's less of less of design thinking or projection and more information. Yeah. Um, so. That's my Canadianism, the, uh, you know, the subtle... We're both Canadians. We're, very, we're both Canadians, polite. but I'm Mexican, so it ruins the Canadian side. <laughs> just, just polite nudging. Um, uh, so, yeah, these... Maybe just explain what, what we're looking at here. And uh, these are kind of unsolicited drawings. There's no client or, or kind of organization, although... Um, there was an exhibition curated by my colleagues at CCA called Drawing Codes by Andrew Cutlass and Adam Marcus. And that's where the first drawing in the middle um, came from, was a response to this uh, exhibition brief. And then we've, we've added to it with the drawings on the left and the right. And uh, I guess, you know, the drawings really emerged out of um, uh, you know, this moment in 2016 when uh, Trump was elected. And there was a this kind of moment of silence in, in the office um, at CCA, uh, I, I would say generally in the city uh, from what I could tell, and, and also a kind of moment of, of helplessness of trying to understand. Um, I think there's just, we're in a moment in the country where it's very difficult for different sides to understand each other. It just seems like there's completely different worlds that exist in the same country uh, and very different values. And I was so struck by how much, <laughs> leading up to the election, um, the conversation was about identity politics, right? That uh, 
Trump would offend a particular group, and then it was like, how's this group gonna vote? He, they probably won't vote for him anymore, and it was always, you know, identity politics. And the most striking thing to us in the studio um, was just looking at the graph, the kind of uh, New York Times put out a map, a very high resolution map with all the counties mapped, so it wasn't the kind of uh, low res of just the state, but at the county level um, where votes were distributed, and that map looked like a population density map um, mm -hmm. for us, and it was just a, a curiosity to ask, you know, how much does density um, play a role in, in people's voting preference? And so we crunched the data. That's the first time we've actually been in Excel for so long in, uh, in the studio. And we went through, um, and Liz uh, Lezik, who, who was working in the office, is uh, an amazing you know, Excel expert. I don't think she would want that title, but uh, she is. No one wants that title. But she is an amazing uh, you know, Excel wizard. And we, we graphed. So what you're seeing on the far right is kind of voting preferences, blue dots and red dots of every single county in America. And those lines are the trend lines between um, density, in this case depicted as the distance to your neighbor, and where you're gonna vote, and there's a sort of tipping point. Um, and you can see the graph, the, the lines are pretty smooth that, you know, Trump is really capturing 80, 90% of the vote in some of the lowest density counties, and uh, Hillary's capturing, uh, you know, 80, 90% of the vote in the highest density counties. But, you know, between that, it, it, there's also kind of a, a very clear arc. And there was a tipping point once we crunched the, the census data at about 600 feet to your neighbor. So, you know, if you're, <laughs> Your neighbor's more than 600 feet away. And 600 feet seems a lot, but this is an average kind of distance, so it includes roads, sidewalks, you know, depending on different urban realms. Um, so if you're more than 600 feet away, you're more likely to vote for Trump. And if you're less than 600 feet away, um, you're more likely to vote for Hillary. What the image in the middle is showing is we, we picked 50 emblematic um, density ranges, you know. So what you're seeing on the far left and the far right are um, areas that are highly voting for uh, Hillary in that campaign. And, and as you move to the center, lower density and where Trump's capturing more, more of the vote. And we wanted to show these things because oftentimes the discourse um, is just about urban versus rural and it's, it's very polarizing, but there's actually a lot of landscapes that exist between cities and rural areas that we, you know, from suburbs, exurbs, hinterland, you know, we, we have some terminology, but we don't fully have all the terminology to understand these landscapes. So we just wanted to show what these spaces look like. Um, and, and on the far uh, left, um, there's a bit more of a summary uh, of averaging each of these density ranges and, and depicting these kind of three islands of, of America, where you kind of have uh, Republican America, Democrat America, and this America in the middle that kind of oscillates between, uh, you know, kind of that's, that's the vote that is really being, you know, um, that's where they're trying to get the vote, I guess, you know. So the so the the foundations of each of these squares corresponds to a to a data point. Yeah, exactly. So that each of those squares in that first drawing is one acre, and that's an emblematic one acre uh, for a particular uh, vote range. So on the far left is plus eighty percent Hillary, and then plus uh, seventy percent, and so forth, kind of. And that's and what we did was we actually went to those counties, we looked at the density, and we screenshotted from Google Earth uh, an emblematic acre that had that density and then redrew it. Mm -hmm. uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, this is an exciting moment. <laughs> Just play the video. <laughs> So this wonderful scroll you produced, the, uh, the open water produced for this project, and uh, Martin explained to me, I hadn't seen it, and we, I, you know, we hadn't discussed it, but um, he explained to me, and then when we were writing the labels, um, 
and it's actually a piece that I spend a lot of time with gallery guides and so on to try to explain parts of your pro project and how to talk to audiences about it. And um, once I saw it here, printed and on, installed, it's just so, uh, it's just a really beautiful, elegant drawing. And I love the Song Dynasty scroll that it references. I think that it's one of the most important pieces of art, in the history of art because of the because it's so rare in it in the span of the landscape to city to landscape um, effort that is made in really mapping that the world in the Song Dynasty. Of course in your case there was a moment when we were either having a discussion about labels and labels are, are important because that's the way that we communicate with audiences and there is always a kind of moment of thinking through how do you say this very complex thing? You're not a non-complicated. Yeah. You're not a non-complicated thinker. So there is like, do you actually translate or simply transcribe what in your the architect is saying, and how then do you explain that to general audience, or do you explain that to general audience? Do you perform that? In other words, do you have a gallery guide discuss and exp in this case, I think the piece is, is very clear, and it's much clearer than the label. And it's simply, <laughs> and so um, it's it's clear because it's expressing a world where the interconnectedness is not only an extractive interconnectedness. So historically, perhaps we can think of the countryside producing, and the or the countryside producing both in terms of food, but also minerals, wood, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, other types of resources, and the urban environment using but now it's it's really kind of a complicated loop back mechanism that is occurring uh, can you speak a little bit to that yeah well I think I think um, it's a really astute point that you know the role of the countryside and the city are, are you know always trans uh, transforming um, for us and I don't know how many of you guys know the the original piece that the scroll is referencing it's um, called life along the river uh, by Zhang Zedong the Song Dynasty, it's, it's an amazing scroll that um, is, is super you know, beautiful and, and kind of shows how this river structured urbanization, um, both for industry and culture and so forth. And you know, I, I think this scroll really emerged in response to the Trump uh, Hillary drawings that was trying to identify you know, politics as a spatial thing that we don't think about, you know, that, that where we live, where we grow up affects what we believe in, and these these values are heavily structured by certain infrastructures that allow us to live in these uh, different environments. Um, so, for instance, like what you're seeing in this last you know moment of the the thing is a is a pipeline uh, that kind of ends the scroll, and you know the pipeline was a very critical uh, artifact that was designed to not just move oil and gas from areas of resource extraction to refining in areas of consumption. But it's been deemed a dissociating technology, that it's something that allows particularly markets that are consuming uh, these resources to be very abstracted from where these resources are coming from, uh, which means that the ecological footprint or the footprint of you know, labor practices uh, are very abstract because for, for the people that are mostly consuming these things, uh, which I think is one of the issues that we're confronting in society that a lot of the, the problems we're dealing with are highly abstract because we don't see them and we don't understand their interconnectedness. Um, so this was, it's, you know, it's not just about resource extraction and consumption, it's in some ways trying to show these different forms of density that occur um, and, and how they're linked together and that they're both highly interdependent areas that are connected by highways and pipelines and so forth, but they also take on their own um, particular qualities and, and that you know what I would say that you know we, we call this uh, exhibition new investigations in collective form in reference to Maki but what we think about or discuss as collective in each of these environments is quite different that it's, it's a relative thing that collectivity in an urban environment and what you would consider a collective space in a suburban environment or an exurban environment or the countryside are very different and there's a tendency for uh, I think architects that are much more uh, particularly in the last few hundred years very pro city to um, when they design or work in environments that are not urban to impart urban values to almost kind of feel that these are values that need to be you know executed in the suburbs or, or whatnot and 
you know, this isn't really a critique of these environments. It's to say that, you know, each of them has a particular form of collectivity that we need to understand and unpack and design for because if, if you choose to move to the excerpts, you choose for a particular reason because you had a choice maybe to move the city as well. And, and so you have to, and I think there's a kind of humility as an architect to understand that that is a choice someone's made and what are the types of spaces in those environments that create collectivity. I also find that very, I, I, I'm, from, I'm from the countryside in Mexico and we would never call it the excerpts. <laughs> the excerpts is like uh, not the countryside yet. It's the uh, it's I don't know it's defined into ways, but it's sort of the area of um, like typically the McMansions that are past the first and second ring suburbs, uh, you know, sort of on the, the out, outer outer suburbs. So, so Rancho del Mar in like yeah. by La Jolla or something. Yeah, yeah, something. Exactly. Even I mean it's just interesting because of the definitions of space, right? So whereas in the countryside that of course is much more conservative. The kind of relationship to the space is about memory oftentimes. It's being there for long generations or it's about the more kind of day-to-day -day work that you do uh, and so on. Um, I don't know, it's just uh, generally speaking, the, the experience of urban life. I mean personally, honestly, the experience of living in cities and Mexico City, San Francisco or whatever, Boston, is much more related to my career in a way. Now, I'm very, um, if I just think about it emotionally. And, um, and nature doesn't actually play a role in this dialogue. It's not about being closer or further away from nature. It's about kind of the spaces of communality or collectivity that are formed. Maybe we should go to the, to the next slide. Oh, yes, you see it all. And then the next, please. And following slide, please. Okay, so this this is this fantastic piece that the Open Workshop has created uh, with the team here at YBCA. That includes, of course, Martin, Tesser, John Cartwright, Tesser Freeman, John Cartwright, the whole installation team, and Elena Lyman. I want to just acknowledge their work as well. Um, and we are very grateful for the really beautiful installation you have all made. Um, you'll see it in a minute. Uh, I've been thinking for a long time as a curator of how to, the, how to actually display architecture in a way that these models don't become, uh, this fl I mean, they are not flat objects to architects, but they can be flat objects to the rest of us who are not as trained to read what is being proposed. And I think that you guys have actually created a really unique experience that allows for, again, that intimacy of the miniature and the kind of, to break down some of the unhelpful um, confrontations of urban non natural versus non-natural or communalidad or communal or community or collectivity versus non. So congratulations, it's really wonderful. Thank you so much, and I should also say that this wasn't me alone, that the office, and there's a slide coming up which you know has a photo of them all and, and their names, but um, this was a, a huge communal effort, uh, and a lot of these amazing people in the first and second row, um, this would not be possible without them, you know, from the scroll and so forth, so this, this is, I'm just here to answer the tough questions. <laughs> so when you were, when, we, when you proposed this project, it was, uh, first of all, why did you propose it? course. And second, what are the key elements for you in this project? Formally, of course, we can see that it has hanging structures on um, small, let's say, um, marble and wooden uh, trays. But, but what is the function of that form of display? Yeah, so, you know, we, we kind of propose something crazy and, and you, you expect um, your clients, in this case YBCA, to pull you back and they were like, great. Yeah. And then we were like, oh, okay, <laughs> let's figure this out. Um, so I guess, you know, you made a really great point, Lucia, that architecture, um, it's a really strange medium because you're using tools of models and drawings to represent something to be built in the real world. And there's this kind of, there's always a translation that happens. Uh, and, and these, you know, whether it's beautiful or even construction drawings, there's, something that's produced as an interface to something that becomes uh, something real in the world. 
And because of that, you know, in a gallery, it's kind of weird because you don't, you know, it's not the real world. And how do you experience something that's not? You take photos of buildings. You know, we're already in such a photo saturated <laughs> culture. And so we wanted to make, um, or say, erode the distinction between, um, you know, the subject looking at something as a passive observer and the subject being an active participant in the exhibition. And, and essentially, what you're seeing is a. In, you wouldn't think so by the photo, but it's, these modules are all hanging on a grid. I know they look not gridded. Um, and their structure that they're hanging from is all interlinked. So all of these ropes are tying them together on a series of pulleys, which means that moving one module actually affects a, a range of modules around it. Um, and for us, this was really, again, a, a metaphor to some degree on the relationship between the individual and the collective, that individual actions can actually make collective uh, changes and particularly in things that are tough to move because this is all about weight so it literally is indexing how heavy things are you know, that they're hanging in right now. Um, things that are heavy to move can still be moved but you actually need to get two or three individuals like friends <laughs> to to move things around them to kind of push certain modules down to push others up. Um, so that was one big part of it was how do you actually engage people in the production of the work itself and how do you relate to their body in different ways. Um, so some of these modules you actually are meant to look at from below, and you see that in this kind of module with um, string hanging uh, from, from the underside that Laura so you know, uh, elegantly sewed together, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if that's even the right word. Um, two other modules that you know, are much lower, but require you to get close to look into them, and again, that kind of quality of intimacy uh, and then there's you know, others that were something sitting on a platform and they're much more collective and those are the sort of bigger models that you can see right now that you can see from a distance and you know, gather hubs of themes and each of these bigger models that you see, the kind of white ones, and this was taken at 5 p.m. so you can tell that we were cutting it right, right close to the end because the, the paint paper is still on the ground and so forth. Um, <laughs> there's like part of one model sitting on another model. Um, <laughs> but these, these larger hubs are essentially um, models that we find, of uh, projects that we find to be emblematic of these five uh, thematics that I brought up earlier. And, and the modules around them, these kind of walnut marble boxes, um, have different studies and projects related to those themes. So it's a, a very fluid transition between these themes that are kind of hosted or, or anchored by these larger models. I think we should open it to questions, if that's okay. Um, any questions in the audience? Can we actually, just before I can we advance the next slide? Oh, yes, can sorry. I, can I thank slide, our amazing please. team? Oh, oh, one more slide. One more. <laughs> so, um, I, I had to, you know, put this slide together to thank this amazing team um, that has been working really tirelessly over the last two months. Um, to, to produce this project. We had a very ambitious idea and a very short timeline, and, and your team here, um, you of course, Lucia, Martin, Tesser, John, Elena, Susie, Rebecca, uh, Charles, uh, Dave, you know, the entire group here was amazing, and, and my team, uh, Jared, an amazing uh, project manager, exhibition designer, and just generally calm guy, or doesn't <laughs> externalize his <laughs> stress as much, uh, Cesar, who, who really, was the uh, brains and, and engine behind the scroll. Uh, Hepa, <coughs> Sean, Blake, Claire, Laura, uh, producing several of these models and then studies and working with the office over the last few years. And we had this sort of deadline SWAT team as well, that, especially this last week to when we realized you know, the, the, the deadline is coming very quickly. So uh, Kenneth, Bella, Nicholas, Sharin, uh, Emily, and Laura, thank you guys so much. So, so now we can have fun to do it. Okay, <laughs> so, great. Yes, there is a question. Can you tell us a little more about each model? They look like designed buildings or proposed models or Yeah, that's uh, it's a great can question. There's the slide again. Yeah, yeah, sure. Can we show one of the back slides, please? Let's see. Um, one more? Yeah, another one, please. One more back. There. 
This, this probably isn't the best image because actually most of the, the walnut boxes, you're just seeing the walnut, not the, uh, the models inside. Um, and when you go into the exhibition, you'll see a variety of, of different uh, investigations in there. Um, some of them, uh, so there's, there's a couple things. One is we're really trying to push the different ways architects represent their ideas. Um, and some of these things are in some ways just fun investigations, you know, so there's like a pop-up book that's been created. Um, and some, you know, so we, we're always in various competitions and uh, project proposals, also trying to push the boundaries of how to represent ideas. Uh, acknowledging that, you know, in architecture, the way you draw the world um, is also part of the way you end up designing the world, that, you know, things you choose to draw, you know, if you, if you make a map about certain flows on a site, you're more likely to respond to those when you do a design. And there's a lot of things that, you know, the plan section elevation can't encapsulate, you know, in <laughs> design. So there's, there's a whole range of, of different techniques that are just trying to push the bar of representing these ideas. And then the actual modules themselves are various uh, projects that have been done over the last five years. Um, some of which were competitions, some of which were uh, uh, RFP proposals, uh, others which were unsolicited. So there's a kind of large range of, of work that we're uh, trying to show. Any other question? I think we may be all very anxious to get to the exhibition and to having a toast with a open workshop. Thank you very much for coming.